This, like that, goes... Look at that. Look at that. That's not the right place for the knob. Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to Molten Modular DIY. Oh yes, this is a brand new series I'm putting together on DIY module building within Eurorack Modular. It's this whole other way of doing Eurorack where instead of buying yourself some kind of module, you get yourself a module in a bag. It's just a module in a bag full of components and panels and bits and pieces and then you have to build the thing yourself. Now the downside of that is you might well blow yourself up or break it or never ever get anything to work. And of course it tends to take up a whole load of time. But on the plus side, you get to expand your modular for a lot less money, as well as it being a completely fascinating thing to do in the first place. Now what I must stress from the beginning, and if you're new to Molten Modular and to me, then this is something that you may not realize or understand, is that I am not an expert. I'm not coming at this to you from some kind of position of authority of knowing what the heck it is that I'm doing. I have built one module, the Turing machine, which is over here, and it's one of my most popular videos. So you'd say that that was a perfectly made Eurorack module. And I built it. I did, I, well, I soldered it. So go and check that out, because that was just a blast. And that was about nine months ago I built that thing, and I promised then to do some more. And now, I am going to start this journey of doing some more. So I have a little bit of experience now, but I'm not an expert. I'm relying upon the expertise of other people to guide me on this journey. And that's what this is. It's a journey. It's my journey of discovery into Eurorack Modular DIY. And I'm doing these videos in order to invite you along into this process, into this adventure. And hopefully it's kind of inspirational in some kind of way hopefully it's entertaining at the very least and maybe in this mess somewhere you'll draw out something which is helpful for your own Eurorack journey so why am i doing this and why are you here watching me do this well i think probably the biggest problem with Eurorack as a whole is that it's bleeding expensive it costs a whole load of money i've sunk an enormous amount of money into this rack over here and that's awesome. I've also been very, very fortunate in a few people giving me modules or lending me modules so, so I can play around with stuff. But ultimately, I'm now at a, at a position a year or two into this game where I just have no money left. There's no money left to invest in more good, wonderful, awesome, posh, pre-made modules. However, I can potentially bring together a hundred quid or so every now and again for something in a bag and that enables me to expand my modular to build more stuff into it to create more sounds and more interesting textures and modulation and sonic possibilities while not breaking the bank the flip side of that is that i have to spend time putting the things together with the potential of not doing it right the potential of breaking it and blowing myself up or setting fire to the shed but ultimately what i am looking to do in this series is to put together a skiff, a row, if you like, of good, cheap DIY modules that can form a synthesizer all of its own. Some sound creating devices, some bits of bobs, some of the more crazy stuff that's gonna sit well with my existing setup as well as being pretty self-contained. So if you're sitting there thinking that your rack is far too expensive and you wish that there was a cheaper way in, then this, I think, could be it. And hopefully, over the coming videos, I will be able to demonstrate and show a whole stack of different modules that you could build, that you could build into your own system and try to keep the price under control. And I'll be very upfront about the prices as well, because I think that's an important factor. So I'm not just going to get a you know, 500 pound kit. From somewhere. I'm not going to get hold of the, you know, the kit version of the Decades Dream from Black Corporation and try to put that together as a, as a cost effective way of doing things. No, 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 I'm going to be looking around about the 100 squids mark, yeah? I don't want anything elaborately expensive, but also I don't want anything so complex that I'm not going to be able to build it within a reasonable time. But those are all considerations and rules and guidelines that no doubt I will throw out of the window as the whim takes me. 
But before we get stuck in, I just wanted to go through the equipment that I have. Well, I say equipment because really it's just a soldier and iron, but there's a few other bits and pieces as well. And I kind of think that through this journey, I will be acquiring a few more bits and pieces along the way in order to make it easier. But we have to start somewhere and we have to start from a basic position. I mean, one of the things about trying to get the costs under control is there's this temptation to throw a load of money at a load of gear, sort of test gear and equipment so that you can do something properly. Well, my experience with a touring machine is that, you know, properly is a very loose, very loose and expandable term. And actually all you need to get started is a soldier and iron, really, a soldier and iron and some solder. And then we can start building up from there. But let me show you the entirety of my collection of equipment. So soldering iron, yes, this, this little fella here. Now I had to buy this because I burnt out my other one during the making of the, the touring machine because I left it on overnight. I and mean, that's the sort of thing that burns your house down. So I don't, I don't recommend doing that at all. But I did also struggle with my existing soldering iron because it was like, it cost £7.50 or something. Not that that's a major deal, but it just, I was getting into a lot of trouble through my own inexperience, through not really knowing how to clean things properly and that kind of thing, and it ended up just burning itself out. So I got a new one, this one here, and I can tell you exactly what it is. It is, I've got it written down over here, it's an Inte 60 watt, 220 volt, soldier and iron with adjustable temperature. See, it has a little adjustable knob here. Because I also found that my solder wasn't always melting and that became a problem. So I wanted something that I could potentially turn up if I needed to. But it's a simple 20 quid soldier and iron from Amazon that came in a little kit with a few other bits and bobs. So if you're wondering which soldier and iron to buy, then by all means, get onto forums and Facebook groups and ask. But my advice is look on Amazon, go for something around 20 quid, look for how many stars it's got and just go for it. You have to start somewhere. I mean, you were probably taught soldering at school at some point and they would have had the crappiest soldering irons in the world ever. And it works, it can work. So, you know, don't agonize over it. Don't get anxious about it. Just drop a 10 or 20 quid on a soldering iron and go for that. I had this stand knocking around from something else that I don't remember. So that's very handy. And those are handy things to have so you don't burn your desk or whatever it is you're working on. Other things I have. I have a pot of solder here. Now I've got two lots of solder. This is the, the lead free solder, which is what I is just what I had and what I used for my Turing machine. Now everybody in the comments after the Turing machine was saying, oh, you don't want to use lead free solder, that's rubbish, apparently, but it worked for me. Now I do also now have a tub of lead solder, you know, dead poisonous kind of stuff <laughs> that came with my soldering iron. So it'll be interesting to compare the two to see what all the fuss is about. As I understand it, the lead stuff just melts easier and therefore it's easier to use. That's one of those sorts of things we're going to discover. But also when you start using lead products, you then got to think about what you're breathing in as this smoke comes off it and it starts, you start inhaling poisonous fumes. Is that good? I don't know. Maybe we need to sit ourselves in some kind of extractor cupboard. I don't know. That's also advice that I've had that you need some kind of smoke extraction contraption. But, you know, <laughs> Is that a piece of equipment too far? I don't know. I mean, I'm only doing this like occasionally. Uh, who knows? Another thing that hopefully we will discover on our journey. Next up is the solder sucker. Had a lot of comments about solder suckers as well in that solder suckers are, are not as wonderful as one would think. I mean, it, it's, it, for me, it's an awesome piece of equipment because you've messed up a bit of soldering and you get your solder sucker, you press the, the end down, and it just sucks the solder out of that situation. So you heat it up, you go stop, and it sucks all that solder off. Now apparently that has all sorts of terrible things could happen if you do that. <laughs> and you should use a desoldering braid instead, which is a length of kind of wick wire stuff that I have no idea how that desolders anything, but apparently it does. Again, that might be one of those things that we'll look into over time. And feel free to tell me all about it in the comments. That's always good. 
the other thing, the thing that I did do, just to show that I do listen to your comments and they are important and you do have an influence on me ultimately, is that I invested in this. What is it? What the heck is that? Well, it's a bunch of kind of steel wool, I think. Steel brass wool, maybe. Copper wool? Oh, well, heck, I don't know. It's this spongy, metally stuff inside kind of the, the top of a bin, like that. And the idea is that this cleans the end of your soldering iron. Because previous to that, I've been using the sponge. The sponge, put water on it, you stick your soldering iron in it, and it kind of cleans off the solder that's gathered on your soldering iron because you're rubbish at soldering. Whereas this, apparently, is far superior. So it cost about a fiver. So I thought, sod it, I'll, I'll give that a go. I haven't used it yet. The idea is you, I guess you, you stick your, I don't know. <laughs> but it's magical, apparently, at cleaning solder off soldering irons. Other things I have, I've got uh, my uh, crocodile clip magnifying glass thing here that might come in handy. I'm not sure. Uh, I'll see. I haven't used it yet, but it may come in handy. Uh, I've got a pair of safety goggles because I have to take my glasses off in order to solder closely. I've got some safety goggles because someone mentioned how losing an eye when soldering is not a is not a good thing. So because I'm on the internet, on YouTube, and children are watching, it's very important that you pay mind to health and safety and bits like that. So I'll probably be using those i suppose and then finally i got hold of a multimeter yes i haven't used one of these since school really i did used to have one up on a shelf that's been there for decades that was my granddad's but sadly when i got it down to check it out the old battery had leaked in the back and the whole thing was destroyed so instead i've picked up a, a, a 10 pound multimeter off amazon which i don't really know I can't exactly remember what to do with it or how it works, but it seems to make sense to me that if I get into a situation where the module that I'm making isn't working, I need something which can help me troubleshoot. I mean, maybe that will never happen. I don't know, but it seemed like a worthwhile thing just to have. And also as a device to have in your house, it just might be useful. The only thing I can remember really is that you put it onto the resist, you put the you can check a connection because of the beep. And that in itself is awesomely useful. So that's it, that's, that's my collection of bits and bobs, essentially a soldering iron, some solder, something to clean it with, something to suck it off with. <laughs> However, there's a whole raft of other stuff that people suggested uh, in the comments from my Turing machine video, things like a jeweler's lupe, which is, you know, the thing they stick in their eye, which I thought was nice. Some lead former or lead former pliers. Apparently they're, they're useful. Cutters, I might have, you know, I've got some cutters, uh, those sorts of tools uh, knocking around. Uh, masking tape was recommended. Also blue tack for holding things together. Flux, people go on about flux, which I can't quite remember what that's for. I think it makes things work better. I don't know. But lots, lots and lots of great suggestions. And keep those coming because, you know, I find them useful. I find your interest useful. And there might be some tips in there that will be become completely vital that I can then expand upon and share as my own discovery and take all the credit for it. To start with, certainly, I'll be looking at kits which are all through hole kits that means that you've got a pcb and you've got components that go through that pcb for soldering I'm not going to be doing any surface mount at least not to start with i believe that surface mount is going to come into my life because there's some lots of interesting kits out there that do have surface mount components now the issue with surface mount is purely that they are weeny they are really really small and you're supposed to solder them to the top of the pcb board rather than through a hole and how on earth do you do that I don't know, something to do with heat guns, apparently, or heat chambers, or putting them in the oven, or, I don't know, tweezers, tweezers, yes, tweezers. So there's lots of things to learn in that regard. So what sort of kits should I be building? Well, I bought this, which is a, a low-pass gate from uh, RYO. It's called the Aperture 
1.0. I bought this ages ago as to be my next project after the Turing machine, and I'm still very keen to build it. But I don't think I'm going to start there, because the low-pass gate is interesting to me, but it's not interesting if you're building your first row of Eurorack. So I'm probably going to pull together something like an oscillator and a filter. They seem to be kind of the key starting points of any Eurorack project. I'd imagine something that makes noise, something that lets you play with that noise. Then I'm going to get into VCAs because those are always helpful envelopes. And from kind of once I'm past the basic building blocks, I'd like to get into the more sort of weird and crazy stuff. Some effects, some modulators, some sequency weirdy things and burst generators and bits and bobs. Who knows where it's going to go from this point? Because I, I am literally making this up as I go. But my first video, which I'll be doing shortly after this, is going to be tackling the thorny question of the case and power supply, because that's where you have to start. You can't do any of it if you've not sorted out how you're going to plug the thing into power. So I have a lot of ideas about that, or rather I have one idea about that, which I'll be sharing in the next video. So I think that's enough of an introduction. If you want to see my first attempts at building a module, then do check out my video on the Turing machine. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing it. And that really has been the reason why I've come to this decision to do a series on it. That, the cost, the price, the fact that soldering stuff together is a whole load more fun than you would think. It really is. I mean, you can lose yourself in an evening of just focused, gentle, zen-like and meditative and contemplative work of just soldering and putting stuff together slowly, carefully working it out, turning it over through your hands, just going through that whole process is just immensely enjoyable. So to me, it seems like a completely obvious next step is to get into all of that. Now, no doubt I'll be constantly apologizing to the DIY community out there because they know what they're doing. I don't, I'm not pretending to know what I'm doing. I'm honestly just trying to move my way along this journey and discover what I discover as I go, learning, hopefully, not making too many mistakes and ultimately to be able to build some fun modules. So if I'm giving bad advice, if I'm demonstrating something awfully, then please tell me about it in the comments. Let's make it a discussion. Let's make it a shared journey because anyone who's coming at this with a lack of experience is going to need help. And with a bit of luck, we can all sort of help each other. So please sign up, please subscribe. This is going to be kind of a separate series to my Molten Modular series. This is going to be Molten Modular DIY. Those three little letters there are going to make it all the difference. So you can follow this video after video without it getting interrupted by other reviews and bits and pieces that I do. And I'm really quite excited about all this. So I'm going to start getting other things together. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes. Mm -hmm.